Um, I uh, have been a Unitarian Universalist for 20, for 20 years. My first uh, 10 years were in parish ministry, and my last 10 have been in community ministry, and I currently serve as both the community minister at our um, church in Bloomington, as well as the executive director of Shalom Community Center, which is a resource center for people experiencing extreme poverty uh, in Bloomington, most, most notably hunger and homelessness. It's a an honor to be with you and to, to share with you today, and uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you having me. Our opening words today come from Thomas Merton, and he said that our, our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. What we are asked to do is to love. And this love itself will render both ourselves and our neighbors worthy. Hate is a uh, strong word. It burns a bit even to, even to use it, even to mention it, to, st to say it. But it took me about this many years old to admit to myself that hate was the right word to describe how I have at times felt about myself. I was certainly a rather sensitive kid, but I don't think such self-hate is particularly unusual, except perhaps in my choice of that label. We sometimes call it a lack of self-acceptance, or low self-esteem or something like that. But as I get older, I realize hate is the right word. Because I think it's important to remember how vicious we can be to ourselves. This internalized hate showed up for me in a belief, in a belief that I received love through success and goodness, that accomplishment and more particularly moral accomplishment, being a good boy, to twist a phrase, was my access to affection, appreciation, and admiration. So this led to two things for me. One, it drove me to accomplishment, to push myself to do well and to be good, in quotes, in some ways. I'm grateful for that push. I'm grateful for that inclination. But it also prevented me from being real, from being honest, from being self-aware. There was a whole world of failure, imperfection, ugliness, unacceptability in myself that I could not, would not, face. I barely even knew it was there. The first real break for me around this was in seminary about 25 years ago, and I remember, I remember taking a career assessment in my first year. As part of that assessment, I met with a psychologist, and this person asked me a question I'd never been asked before. What don't you do well. And the sad reality was I was too self-protective and too lacking in self-awareness to know the answer to that question. To my great shame, the psychologist thought I should drop out of seminary, <laughs> that I could never handle the emotional rigors of ministry. And yes, 25 years later, it is a little satisfying <laughs> to know I defied her expectations. <laughs> but at seminary, I also encountered a community of faculty and students that created an opportunity for connection beyond my own images of perfection. The people in that school taught me how to be safely in relationship with others in a way that was not based on shame or self-protection 
or putting people down to lift oneself up. And they, they help me develop a theology of love, more than words, but a, a way of living that made it safer for me to explore the edges of what I deemed imperfect in myself. The second you know, break in this was in my second ministry when I served the church in uh, our church in Princeton, New Jersey, where I started to understand our first principle differently, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. That that affirmation was not necessarily a statement of our goodness, that we are all good but more of a statement that no matter what, we are loved anyway. That our worth is not defined by our actions, but by our existence. It is immutable. It is ours completely. I began to understand that to fully love myself I had to embrace not just my goodness, but all of me. That to resist my failings was to shut myself off to a significant part of me. To that part of me that wasn't a success. And it was a relief, honestly, to set aside the striving. My third break in this work, in this kind of challenge and struggle, with, uh, was coming to work with people in poverty every day through the Shalom Center, where I work now. In this work with people experiencing hunger, homelessness, mental illness, addiction, chronic illness, disabilities and disfigurements, criminal backgrounds, trauma, and even more mundane things like a lack of cleanliness or unusual vocalizations or, if you will, poor social skills. I was placed in an environment where everyone around me had something that society had rejected. In this group of marginalized people, to use a rough term, the losers of society, those who have lost practically everything, came a simple honesty. That which middle class society often hides from and flees, here it was everywhere. And in learning to love all those rejected things in those guests of Shalom, I learned to love those rejected things in me. It's not why I do the work, but it is most de definitely a direct result of being in the work. There is a surprising truth to Merton's words. What we are asked to do is to love. And this love itself will render both ourselves and our neighbors worthy. That in the act of loving, trusting, the acceptance of others, love for ourselves emerges. We are so often told that we need to love ourselves to love others. But what is also true is that we need to, and we're rarely told, is that we need to love others to love ourselves. Because the contrary, what we most struggle to accept in others is also what we most struggle to accept in ourselves. 
One of the most powerful universalist statements I ever read came from, of all places, Woody Guthrie. He wrote, Love is the only God I'll ever believe in. The books of the Holy Bible never says but one time exactly just what God is. And in those three little words, it pours out a hundred million college educations and says, God is love. And that is the only real definite answer to 10,000 wild questions and queries that I, my own self, tossed at my Bible. I mean to say that is the only really sensible, easy, honest, warm, plain, quick, and clear answer I found. When I was ready to throw so-called fearly, cowardly, thieving, poisoning religion out my back door, it was these three words that made not only religion, but also several other sorts of superstitious fears and hatreds in me meet one very quick death. God is love. God is really love. We are universalists. We are universalists. And that places us in a specific historical religious tradition. We, we affirm that God is love. When and where universalism arose in the United States, Calvinism was the dominant tradition. The idea that our wickedness was thorough and it was only through the gesture of an angry yet reluctantly merciful God that we were saved from the torture of eternal damnation. Congregationalist minister Jonathan Edwards spoke in his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, the God that holds you over the pit of hell much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince, and yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. Need to take a breath after that one. And if you're wondering, Jonathan Edwards was no small-town country preacher. He was among the most prominent religious voices of the day. And like a bouquet of resistance to self-hate, universalism emerged as a, mo as a movement of resurrection, a pulsing light in the darkness that said, yes, you matter. Universalist preacher John Murray said, give them not hell, but hope and despair. Do not push them deeper into their theological despair, but preach the kindness and everlasting love of God. Like the first dew fall fresh from the word, like the first bird calling out in the dawn, love captured us in a time when hope was lost and despair was doctrine. Do not push them deeper into theological despair. And we debated, we debated how far that love would go, what to do with those who committed the greatest atrocities. Do we need hell to punish people so that they stay good? There's a tale from a uh, preacher from a different faith encountering one of our most famous universalist ministers, Hosea Ballou. And this preacher said to Baloo, if I thought like you, I would hit you over the head, steal your horse, and be out of here. And Baloo responded, if you thought like me, no such thing would occur to you. Our universalist ancestors, our early universalist ancestors said no to hell which is what made them universalists, although they debated about whether the afterlife had punishment in it. 
John Murray said that no one would be permanently damned, that God would continue to extend uh, his hand in love to us all. And while it might take a while for us to embrace that hand, like, say, you know, 10,000 years, still it was there. Hosea Ballou, on the other hand, said that sin was its own punishment. And upon our deaths, we were immediately reunited with God. That the embrace of a loving God was always and immediately there. These two threads of our history, the restorationists represented by Murray and the ultra-universalists represented by Ballou, played out in their own way the struggle to embrace a God of love and how to address justice in a hurting world. Yet they were aligned in their vision of the God who loves. One of my favorite universalist mission statements I've ever seen is to love the hell out of this world. <laughs> I went to see Michelle Alexander uh, here, here in India, actually at but Butler, uh, a year ago. And Alexander is the author of the book, The New Jim Crow, which is, uh, is a, an amazing book that explores the racism built into our criminal justice system. And it was, it was an amazing night. It was, it was so powerful. Some of you may have even been there at this, at this talk. Uh, and she inspired me over at, uh, I always forget how to pronounce it, Cowles, Coles, Coles, Clues, Clues, thank you, Clues, <laughs> Memorials, something. <laughs> but it was over, Hall, thank you. <laughs> So it was, it was over there, and uh, just a really powerful, amazing night. The place was packed, uh, and it was just so powerful. And she inspired me with her knowledge and words of wisdom. And I was, I was struck most by something I wasn't expecting to find. She talked about how, at one point, she felt that perhaps Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s charge to love wasn't enough, that it was Pollyannish. But then she read his words and saw the clarity and depth of what he was calling for. In the talk, Alexander said, what we need isn't just a political or economic revolution. We need a revolution of values. She spoke of the call to want for your children what I want for my children. To want for your children what I want for my children. Author Bell Hooks tells us the transformative power of love is the foundation of all meaningful social change. As we enter the fall of 2019, I know many of you are struggling with the state of the world. Countless shootings, including Gilroy and El Paso and Dayton and etc. A child reminds us of the imminent threat of global warming. Electoral corruption has come to our dramatic attention with a presidency that may be the most corrupt of our lifetime. And so much more. Homelessness, especially street homelessness, has increased the last three years after a decade of decline. The unjust incarceration of people of color remains a national nightmare. The Me Too mo movement has exposed how far we have to go to be an equitable society. And white supremacy somehow seems to be in vogue. And so it's super, it's super appropriate to ask, how does love address all that? <laughs> and I don't know. I don't. I do, I do know, I do know that love is, is the answer. It is the moral vision for the world that we want. It is the foundation, it is the ground, the possibility, the hope. And how could it be any other way? Seriously, what other... What other alternative is there? <laughs> what other world could we want but 
one with love as its very core. So despite the fears, the threats, the struggles, and the challenges, we are, we are, we are called to be universalists. We are called to love and to be loved. We are called to transcend our fears, to stretch beyond our despair, to, if you will, have faith. Yes, faith. You know, faith is sometimes a controversial word for me. Faith is not about how it's sometimes shallowly used as an intentional denial of truth, right? Faith for me is about fighting for something that's worth believing in. Fighting for something that's worth believing in. When the odds are against us, when the world looks filled with hate and despair, we hold on to what ought to be. We are universalists. And the world needs us. The world needs us to love the hell out of this world. Shalom, amen, and blessed be.